Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting of Tamarborough Council on the 8th of February. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, we haven't had any apologies, but we've got two that are going to be late. Michelle Cook is in traffic at the moment, coming back from Birmingham, and Chris Cook is in training for another committee, and he hopes to get here uh, before the end of the meeting, so let's see. Do we have any other apologies to note? I don't believe so. No. Uh, minutes. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 8th of December 2022 are here for approval. Can I request a move and a seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor Cook. All those in favour? It's been a true record. Yep, thank you very much. Do we, ask, uh, do we have any declarations of interest on any of the items tonight? No. Uh, update from me is already covered as we go through the, the meeting. Um, responses to reports of the Corporate Screening Committee. <clears throat> I took our eight recommendations from this committee on the asset management strategy, which we all had a good discussion on in December. Uh, they were presented to Cabinet at this meeting on the 19th of January. Cabinet agreed that it would report back to this committee on its recommendations directly so that those recommendations don't get lost. We've added them to the, our actual log. And then the plan is to start the municipal year. We look back at that and just see how we had an answer. Um, and if not, look into it. If everyone's happy with that approach. Yeah. Very, very happy, Mr. Chairman. Good, thank you. Um, six, consideration of matters referred to this committee from Cabinet Council. There are no new items. Seven is the uh, main item of the night, which is the quarter three, 2022-23 performance report. Um, let me just check one thing here. Yeah, working groups are later. Okay, so let's uh, have a look. We've got the leader of the council, Councillor Jamie Oates, and Chief Executive Andrew Barrett here. So I'll hand over to the leader to present the report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, so we have before you uh, course three performance report, uh, which follows the same format as the uh, previous ones that we brought to you. Uh, so we'll just very quickly run through the highlights. Uh, the first section uh, of the report details the, the position with the reset and, sorry, the recovery and reset program. Um, you'll notice that as this is the end of quarter three's report, uh, there are a number of issues in there uh, which are now uh, out of date, for want of a better phrase, uh, as we've had notification around the levelling up fund two uh, bid. Uh, Townsborough Council was unsuccessful this time and we were awaiting feedback uh, from from the government on on which which areas uh, to improve on uh, for levelling up fund three. Um, as a result of that, a number of pieces of work have started to happen. Uh, however, uh, the board has not met since that announcement, uh, so I have no further update on that this evening. Uh, work streams that were ongoing that weren't affected by the levelling up fund uh, are continuing uh, continuing to be delivered. Uh, including the uh, uh, the movement of all floors in Marmion House down to the ground floor. If you remember, we were cons consolidating our use of Marmion House, the smallest possible space, uh, and that c that's continuing, uh, and drawings and, and layouts and plans have, uh, have been seen and approved. Um, in terms of corporate project summary, uh, you know, section two of the report, uh, you'll see that the majority of these are in green and progressing well with the exception of Corporation Street, which is currently in amber. Uh, the next section of the report actually goes into a tiny bit of detail. Uh, that following on from levelling up fund and work undertaken, the project needs further discussion. Uh, we're unable to deliver this project based on the current scope and format. We chose not to include Corporation Street uh, project in the levelling up fund bid. Uh, as, as, we were, as we were going through that bid process, we identified a number of issues, a number of questions around that particular project. So I chose not to submit it. And now we're looking at, uh, at whether we're able to deliver that project at all. So that's, uh, that's uh, in need of further discussion and, and revision on that particular project. Next section of the report uh, gives you a bit of context uh, and explains where each of the different projects sit uh, against, the, uh, against the priorities of the, of the council. Uh, so, skipping through those very quickly uh, onto the uh, section that we're, 
we discuss a number of times at this committee over the last, uh, last few years, uh, and that is the impact of benefit reform and the impact of the economy. Uh, so if we skip through to, it's 30 on my PDF, page 30 on my PDF, uh, section eight, the impact of welfare benefit reform and COVID-19 on council services. Uh, you'll see a reduction in the number of discretionary housing payments uh, in, in terms of the claims reported. Uh, and that's illustrated in those two uh, diagrams on, on that page there. Uh, there's also, uh, you'll see a reduction in the, uh, in the caseload, uh, in terms of the life caseload uh, for housing benefit and council tax claimants. Uh, so there's been a reduction in that. However, we are seeing early signs of some sort of impact of the tightening of the economy. And we're seeing that elsewhere in terms of our collection rates. Uh, both with council tax and, uh, and housing rents. Nothing significant at the moment, uh, but there seems to be a, a slight challenge in, in, in the collection rates, uh, which is beginning to appear. Um, I believe the figure I was, uh, I was given last night on the latest position in terms of council tax uh, collections was we're, we're about 1% down on where we would like to be. Uh, so that's 1% down on the target for this time of the year. So that's, uh, that, that's the latest figure as opposed to quarter. Uh, quarter three. Um, in terms of universal credit, uh, you will see there's a steady increase in the number of council tenants on universal credits, uh, and you'll also see there's an increase in the number of council tenants who are in rent arrears who are also on universal credit. Uh, and you'll see that percentage is, is is fluttering around, slightly down on last quarter, but in general, there's a, there's a steady a steady increase on those claim universal credit, and there's also a steady increase on those uh, who are in rent arrears. Um, in terms of the uh, financial uh, health check, uh, the issues are, are all detailed within the, within the paper, starting on page 43 of my, of my PDF in front of me, uh, and that shows the impact on the general fund in terms of the current position uh, we're in at the end of quarter three. So there's a slight variance there. Uh, nothing outside what we'd expect. So that's pretty much the, the headlines that you normally uh, receive at the quarterly performance report. Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Anyone got any questions for the leader or the chief executive? Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think I asked this question um, at the last meeting, or the last time I considered the quarterly performance report, and it's just something I've noted on the last couple of quarterly performance reports, and I don't think it's anything the leader's done personally. At least I hope not. I don't think you're that powerful. It's just, um, obviously, as we're both aware, and as you alluded to in your introduction, obviously the economy's taken a slight downturn. Obviously, a number of factors involved in that war in Ukraine, former Prime Minister's dealings with taxes, and obviously... Um, you know, post-COVID, I just find it a little bit strange that actually number of claimants for universal be uh, benefits slash housing benefit um, is actually down compared to previous years, which seems strange to me, given the downturn in the economy, that actually the number of claimants is down. It, it just seems very strange. Now, I'm not disputing the data. I absolutely have full confidence that it's correct. It just seems very strange. I just wondered if you had any feelings or thoughts of why claimants are down when the economy is actually in a worse place than it was. Uh, it just seems very strange to me. I just wonder if there's any thoughts. I can give you a personal opinion. And that'll take it. <laughs> and, and personal opinion is based on, on other activities uh, in terms of employment away from the council. Uh, a number of sectors are struggling to recruit in, in Tamworth. Uh, and the, the two examples that spring, spring to my mind are part-time bar staff and cleaners, uh, cleaners self-employed cleaners particularly. Uh, so this is only a personal view, and my personal view is I'm not sure that the downturn in the economy necessarily reflects the skills and the employment situation we have in Tamworth. I think there's a, a skew there somewhere. Because if you, uh, if you look at the, the types of staff that I've been involved with trying to recruit and we're struggling because we're just not getting applicants, uh, that would suggest that they are employed in some sort of paid activity yeah yeah warehousing is another one yeah uh, you, you just can't get applicants um the in terms of the the downturn there's also uh, what you will notice in terms of claimants 
is the discretionary housing payment uh, claimants, and these are these are those that sit slightly outside your normal scope for housing benefit and council tax benefit, and it's down to the local authority to assess individual cases uh, on their need. Uh, that that's dropped, um, and that's the, that's the one that we normally use in terms of assessing crisis. Uh, so that that for me would suggest that we're catching them and we're helping them out, or, or they're sorting themselves out before they get into that crisis point. I think, I think we committed to get some more information from you last time. I'll have to trace up uh, the officer that was with us last time, because I, I can't remember seeing the response to that, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look for you. Given what we both know is happening in the background. So I only have a few questions tonight. I, actually, can I just take this opportunity to congratulate the officers, considering the uh, economic turmoil we're in, in as a country at the minute. Actually, reading through this quarterly performance report, I think the performance of the officers have been excellent in that quarter. There's very little to pick out of this report to say there's something to raise. You know, so credit to your officers, Mr. Barrett. It's some really, you know, there's nothing naturally you pick out and go, oh my God, there's a problem yeah. here. It's a really good report. Um, but obviously, you've got to mention Luff Fund. Um, obviously, it, it's one of those where we were bidding for you know, government grant. I'm not going to sit here and say I was opposed to the bid. I understood what we were trying to do as a council, which was you know, open, unlock Gungate and putting the, you know, a new council office on Gungate was a way of unlocking the site. Some would say it lacked ambition. I get what it was trying to do, so I'm not saying the inside I disagreed with it. Obviously, we didn't get it. We're waiting for that feedback. But there's also that other side of it. We've got to move forward as well. So, I mean, is there any opening thoughts? You said we've not quite had a meeting yet. I hope that's going to be penciled in rather soon because that is rather an important project. But have we got any opening thoughts on where we might go next if that love isn't to come? My concern is obviously the government is in a financial position at the minute, given the world global economics it doesn't have the money it might have thought it had for love funding so if we've been told no at this stage i think it's unlikely we'll see it in a future stage do we have any other thoughts on where we might go with this just opening thoughts thank you okay um i'll give you a quick bit and then hand over to the chief exec uh we were assured in our refusal letter we were assured there was a love three and it was definitely going to happen um i, I, th I think um i think what we what we have to remember uh, with, with these bids to government uh, and this is why we've put so much work in over the last five years is when the bid comes up they are very often quite tight on their remit uh, so what, what we what we do as an authority is look at the, the projects we've got and select the one that best fits uh, unfortunately that might not necessarily fit the priority outcomes the government has for that particular pot of funding but we'll, we'll select the ones that, that that best fit and we'll, we'll, we'll submit those. Uh, so please don't, uh, don't think a government refusal of funding necessarily means it's a bad project. It just means it doesn't fit their particular one. Um, in terms of the, the Luft 2 announcement, what is, is apparent, uh, if you look at the, the people who have been awarded, the authorities who have been awarded Luft 2, uh, or I, I believe none of the authorities that had Luft 2, or very few if any, had received any prior funding. Uh, now, this wasn't mentioned at the application point, uh, but certainly if you look at the list yeah, of people, so yeah, if, if you look at the list of, of those that did receive uh, Luft 2 funding, they certainly hadn't had Luft 1, they hadn't had town centre funding, and they hadn't had future high street funds. Uh, so, so it would appear that they were trying to spread uh, yeah, uh, uh, across as much of the country as... Had possible. they applied for those, though? Sorry? Had those... Yeah. Thought, some, yeah. some of the... Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew, do you want to pick up? Yeah, I mean, I think we, when we submitted the Luff bid, and, you know, for the record, it was an excellent bid. It was well planned, well put together, um, with the necessary sort of expertise from the team who, uh, who produced it. It was designed so as it's actually slightly sectional. So um, the Luff bid was the maxi version. So that was everything with all the bells and whistles on it. Um, we've got to, um, to, to come back from that and look at something that we can afford to do. Um, the prize is unlocking Gungate South and unlocking the Marmion House site. So that's really, that, that's, that's the end goal. Um, so we are working together to produce a, uh, a pipeline of, of projects which will start with part of Gungate North uh, and sort of work around roughly in the order that I've, I've just said, but in a manner that the council can afford, but also in a manner that um, when bids and opportunities come up, 
we can um, we've got something shovel ready to put in front of government or whoever to say you know we've got this this project here we're in the ground we've got planning permission thank you very much so uh, it's you know it's it's a sad loss not being selected for Luff but there is a plan B that we're currently sort of working up which obviously you know more detail will follow when uh, uh, when it's ready to uh, to, to come out. Yeah, not so much a uh, question, Mr Chairman, just a comment, if I may. <laughs> not a bad one. Uh, to quote the Leader of the Council, something he said to me around 2007, uh, the thing Tamworth has in common with every other town in the UK is, is it's completely unique. Uh, that was the previous leader before that. Oh, whichever one it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, I think, I think one, one of the tragedies is definitely this. I mean, it's a lesson we learned as a council a long time ago, which is, you know, government funding would become available and we'd scramble around very quickly to find something that would slot in there. We did a bit of work quite a few years ago to make sure we had a few projects on the shelf. Green, green book compliance, I remember the term being. Yeah. And obviously we are now in a better place as a council, you know, collective efforts over many years over the years to have things on the shelf we can pull off as government funding's come available. But the government, when they release these funding pots, are sometimes so tight on what you can do with them, you can't always guarantee you'll have a project that slots just in there. And I think that's actually a, a little bit of a failing of the government and collective governments over the years of... Rather than actually opening up pots of funds to areas to say, can you use this funding and justify an economic benefit? No, actually, we want to see this. Well, actually, that's not going to fit every town and every place, is it? So it actually limits what councils can sometimes do. And I just think that's a little bit of a tragedy. It weren't a bad bid, in my opinion. A, a new building for the council might seem a little bit ambitious, but it's the wider project, as we said, it would have unlocked the rest of Gungate, which is a fantastic piece of regeneration for this town. So it weren't a bad bit from that perspective. If it didn't quite tick government boxes... I think that's actually a failing from the government around this council because that's a major piece of unlocking of development for this council. I think the government's misunderstood what we were trying to do and I just think that's a little bit of a tragedy. It's like I say, it wasn't really a question, it was more of a comment, Mr Chairman, and I think both Mr Barrett and Mr Oates would agree with me on that one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you want to come in? Yeah. yeah uh, yes, do, do agree. Uh, and if you, if you cast your mind back, uh, that's the very reason we didn't apply for uh, Luff Round 1 because the... Uh, the, the restraints within there didn't give us an opportunity to apply uh, with any of the projects. Not, none of our projects fit that, that particular fund. Uh, and we still don't know what LUF3 is going to be, even though we are assured we're definitely going to get a LUF3. Uh, we don't know what the criteria will be. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any comments or questions? Yeah, you're going to want, yep. Just last one, Mr Chairman, and it was just basically looking for an update, really. Um, obviously, not trying to be political, but obviously there's only one element of this council where we've declared a crisis, and that's a climate crisis. Obviously, I see in here we've got an update on net zero coming, I think it's 31st of March, and Anna Toon is the lead officer. I just wonder if there's any update the lead or other chiefs that can give us on, you know, I'm aware there's funding within the coming budget later in February for next year to get an officer in place. I just wonder if there's any sort of update we can give, because obviously net zero is a major target for us, and we are a few years into it. Not trying to be political, just looking for an update if I could. Um, no, I mean obviously we've um, we've agreed the baseline uh, with comments from um, from from scrutiny. Uh, we're now awaiting to you know to, to engage the officer to actually start to do the do. So we've got an action plan and a route map um, subject to budget approval. We'll then have um, the resource to deliver that. So, and we have to remember as well we're in a fairly good place because we've done an awful lot of stuff over the years. So we're not starting from a um, you know from a point of, of doing nothing. We changed the light. Um, well, we you know, we reverted to LED lighting, you know, massive saving. We've used low sulphur diesel since um, since Adam was allowed, um, which again is something we you know we're starting at quite a good baseline. Um, so it's the big stuff we've got to tackle, and that's where I think some of the challenges will be. And you know I think it's right to say it will be a challenge. You know, looking at the housing stock, that's going to be a challenge. So um, the one good thing we're doing by reducing our office accommodation, automatically that's got a corresponding decrease in, uh, in, in emissions. So, um, you know, that's probably about as much as I can give you as an update at the moment. 
Sorry, Mr Chairman, I apologise. That was going to be my last question, but Mr Barrett's just said something that's opened up another one. <laughs> yes, yeah, very simple question, really. Obviously, we're going down to the ground floor. Obviously, the servers are on the first floor. Do we have a long-term project yet for the servers in the council? Or Because, obviously, I get you can't just lift the servers up and drop them on the ground floor because of the cooling systems and everything else, but is there a longer-term project now where the servers are going to go? Obviously, if we're abandoning Marmion now. It's just where Mr Barrett said we're coming down. I just remember the servers were on the first floor. I'm going to say yes. And then, then keep very quiet. Um, no, we are moving towards cloud technology. Um, I haven't got a, a, a date for that, but um, that project is, is underway. So that will reduce the need to have permanent servers and on-site storage, etc., etc. It'll then become much more stable uh, for us to use, as, uh, as you'd expect. So ultimately, the, uh, the, the server room will be redundant, which is, is good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to say, uh, you know, our thanks to the officers again, Mr. Chairman, because having read this report, you know, given the circumstances they're working in economically, I think it is a, a very good report that shows a very good performance by the officers of the council. So, just yeah. thanks again to the officers, if I may. Yeah. yeah do you want to come in? In regards to uh, Corporation Street a Gateway Project, uh, just got a question. So, other than um, or even not liking it. Uh, are there any other factors that are holding it back? Is it just cost or is there anything else? So, in, in terms of the, the projects we have, uh, and we, we have a list of them, some of them uh, are funded, uh, some of them are started, uh, some of them are, are well-developed ideas, for want of a better phrase. Uh, Corporation Street is one of those that isn't funded uh, and is, uh, is, is a well-developed idea which fell out of the previous works that have gone down there in terms of the uh, Enterprise Centre and the Assembly Room System, which is the, the next sort of project. Um, the, the difficulty is, because the length of time it's been kicking around, uh, the, the world has moved on and there's different anticipations uh, for the outcomes of, uh, of Corporation Street. In terms of a, a, of a gateway, it's still a significant point. Uh, it's still used in terms of the, the, the bus stops and what have you. Um, however, what we were looking at in terms of a project doesn't fit that need anymore. Uh, so we, we, we've really got to go back and, and refresh that, that whole approach to that gateway uh, to the town centre. Uh, for me, it's not just Corporation Street, it's also Church Street, but it's also uh, linking through down to, down to Silver Street and Holloway and that, that whole end of town, for want of a better phrase. Uh, so for me, it needs, it needs you know, Sitting down in a good thorough discussion as, as to as to how we how we go forward on that project, if we choose to go forward on that project. In terms of a gateway, something needs to be done. In terms of the uh, with regards to the, the, the current project that's been worked up, it, it doesn't fit the need of the of the user or the operators at the moment. Thank you. Sorry, just another one as well. Another complication being is we don't own a lot of it. <laughs> we own a couple of shops, on it, I believe. But that, that's another complication. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to come in? Yeah. Just on Corporation Street, Chair, it might be useful just for, perhaps for the committee to consider. Uh, it's, it's one project that I think in its current format isn't fit for purpose. It really needs to come out, I think, of being a project and going back to being a concept to be developed to become a project. Um, and it's whether or not this committee would feel comfortable in recommending that to Cabinet, that it ceases to be a, a corporate project and officers go away and work up something that can then become a corporate project to give uh, similar outcomes or whatever the outcomes are needed because it's it, it has really hit the buffers um, in its current format okay Jamie, you want to come in councillor uh, echoing the thoughts uh, of andrew there uh, don't forget we this is the second time we've chosen not to put that project forward for funding uh, it didn't meet the criteria for future high street funding in terms of uh, cost benefit ratio uh, in terms of the levelling up fund, it didn't meet the criteria for transport uh, projects and it didn't meet the criteria for, for the levelling up to fund. Uh, so we've actively chosen not to push this project forward twice so far. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that supports what, what Andrew is saying, is it, it, it doesn't quite deliver what, what we anticipated it would. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? No. Okay. Um, 
What about this point we just mentioned there? Do you want to come in? Yeah, go on. Yeah, obviously the chief executive did hint. Does this committee want to recommend to cabinet that they yeah, rework up? The I don't think we need to. I think from the leader said, I think the leader's fully aware of the issue and it's already on the agenda. So I don't think this committee needs to send a recommendation. I think you know everybody's aware of Corporation Street. It's on everybody's agenda. It's just finding the right conditions to get it going. I don't think a recommendation for us will take it any further forward from what I think cabinet already understand. I don't think cabinet needs us to say anything about it. I think as thirty councillors, we know something's got to be done when the conditions are right. Yeah, I think um, I think it's. It, it'll be in the notes we, we provide with the report anyway. So, everyone happy with that approach? Yep. Okay, so, Councillor Harper, yep. Hi, just very briefly, and it's, it's only a small point, but um, we were talking about Marmion House moving the, uh, the whole of the operations down to the ground floor. Um, have you got a time scale for that? The only reason I'm asking is because it's very obvious to everyone in the town with lights blazing away. I've, I've been past there and two or three floors have got lights blasting away in this sort of uh, era of, um, of um, power problems. Um, have we got an absolute time scale for that? Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Andrew to give the, the final details on that, but uh, before, before he does, uh, I'm going to caveat his answer. Don't forget we have tenants in that building. It's not just Tamworth Borough Council that, that operates it. So, so if you've got lights blazing on a particular floor, it may well not be our operation. It may be one of our tenants uh, who will use the building based on their, on their timetable and, and vacate based on their, their timetable. You know? uh, so, so it's not just in our, in our control. Andrew, do you want to give an update on our bit? Yeah, I mean, just the, the, the move down to the ground floor will be to coincide with when the tenants leave the building. Does so, that include the masts? Uh, that doesn't include the masts, no. That includes all of the uh, personnel uh, tenants. So, but I can't give you the actual time scale at this moment in time. What, what we can say, though, is, um, is this floor lay, that floor layout of that movement has been approved by R and R board, and is and is taking place now. So it's not it's not that we're waiting for, you know, to get stuff moving. We we are in in progress as as we speak. Can can you tell me the uh, what tenants we have in there at the moment, and what is the provision for them at the time scale for them to be vacating, or is there a time scale? At the, at the moment, it isn't public knowledge um, because the staff are in consult their staff, county council staff are in consultation, so I can't give you the exact detail to it. Um, but we will ensure that we coincide our move when they vacate our building. So, uh, is that a candid enough answer? Quite, uh, quite understand that answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to echo Councillor Cook's point as well. Obviously, the, the fact that we've commented probably less than normal is because it, it, it is a really good report. Um, so that's a testament to everybody involved. Uh, there is always the usual recommendation just that we endorse the report. So can we, we need a move and a seconder for that, please. Have move, move, move by Councillor Cook, seconded by Councillor Michelle Cook. Everyone in favour? Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you both. You're welcome to stay, but if not, see you next time. Uh, next item, <clears throat> working group updates. So the first one, the quarterly performance report. Uh, I haven't had any feedback yet to my emails. So I'm minded to say we remove it if, if no one has anything they want to do with it. <laughs> Over to you. Yeah, I hope I'm not alone in this comment, Mr Chairman, because I believe in personal responsibility. I firstly offer you my apologies um, for not returning my thoughts on this item agenda. I know you've tried to drive this agenda very well, and to your credit, you really have tried to drive it. Uh, I haven't quite found time to give you my answers, and I just want to offer up in public my personal apologies to you. I did promise you I'd try and do something. I will try and get something done. This uh, My election's got a little bit in the way for a few of us, but I don't think it needs removing. I think it needs a... And, and I put myself on this list, a few of us to actually ante up and give you that feedback, and that's not your fault as chairman. I think that's our fault as a committee for not feeling what I should have done. You have my personal apologies, and I will do something for you. I'll give them a guarantee, but I will say in public I apologise for not referring back to you yet, Mr Chairman. 
Okay, thank you very much. If you really want to apologise, it's a pale ale as well. So I'll keep that word. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so let's leave it on. We'll give it another another try over the next month. I mean, it's probably now likely to with the agenda we've got in March. It's going to be the new municipal year, it's but right thing to do. we've got a couple of months then to to aim towards. If we aim towards the new municipal year as the point we want to get off moving with it, then yeah, happy with that. Okay. Um, next one was the review of leaseholder charges communications working group. I understand you've had a couple of meetings. So who's leading on updates on that? Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and apologies for me for being late yet again. And so the joys of the A38. Um, yeah. So I know obviously Councillor Chris Cook's not here um, at the moment because I know he's um, in another meeting. But um, we've had two meetings now of our working group so just for kind of public record that's um, all three councillor cooks um councillor goodall councillor harper and councillor people um so yeah the we raised in kind of both of those kind of meetings numerous questions which we've gone back to officers um on to get information so data on kind of numbers letters all of the things that we were looking into and on the back of that I think we're kind of in a position and again let me know if I'm wrong and um, other members of the working group but to make a number of kind of recommendations that kind of from our findings um, in terms of the numbers of properties actually affected we did go back to mr weston when he came back today and to confirm that the batch that we're currently talking about includes 44 leaseholder roofs and 72 tamaburra council roofs and from our own stock um, the team have been working through the tbc owned properties over the kind of the time we've been undertaking this review um, and it's really important to state that there will be additional roofs that are required over kind of the, the coming years and that is within their plan we did question also the process previously um, used for undertaking reef replacements um, so to confirm historically there's been a mixture of pre-inspection condition surveys age profiling and local knowledge um, based on repairs history and um, to kind of effectively build up the annual list and we've been effectively starting those inspections but then effectively using photographic evidence in advance of kind of commencement um, the officers are quite adamant that they've been following due process and in this particular um, round they've been using section 20 consultation which historically hasn't happened but due to this time um, that has happened um, there has been kind of that effectively planned into the procurement and historically when works have been done in the past on roofs full recovery of cost per flat has been um, done through effectively an equal share of the actual cost that's kind of the history and the precedent that being said as this committee heard kind of before um, that only about 20 percent of roofs that are actually um, required to be replaced or notified to be replaced are actually assessed in advance so I think this is the working group's major kind of finding ultimately is that an awful lot of people have been told that works are going to be done on their properties when actually they haven't done an inspection so it's not a case of we so yeah if i can just finish this point then absolutely kind of um, i think it's just something that's really really important to kind of stress is that ultimately we as the council have gone out and told people that their roofs are to be replaced when actually in the, the working group's kind of opinion that we should write to people to say ultimately you're on a list can we come and inspect your roof to see if any work is actually required and then we'll set our next step so that's the first thing more than happy to pause and take any questions to that before carrying on so yeah thank you so i had a question on that actually so just to be clear so does that mean that out of those people who've been communicated to there will be a, a potentially significant group who actually don't need any work done and they've potentially been upset for, for no reason is that what we're saying that's correct so there has been evidence provided of times when people have been subject to a, an assessment 
And at that point, they've been told, for sane sake, actually, it's the downpipes that need replacing. So that's a X cost. Um, and charged a £250 fee for an inspection on their reef. OK, so whilst the, okay. so whilst the current process has been followed, presumably the recommendation is to, to look at the... Yeah, OK. Um, yes. I know there was obviously got one resident here tonight, but there were residents who were keen to be kept in, involved. How, how's communication been with the, uh, the residents, please? Um, yeah, so we have been keeping residents updated as much as possible. We've obviously tried to keep, should we say, the, the findings of the working group as much as possible within the working group, because obviously that's kind of what we, we've tried to do, but we have been working, and again, public thanks to those residents for providing us the information and their evidence as well, which has been really helpful. Um, in that, I do have a number of other recommendations from the group as well. Um, so that's the first thing, ultimately, is actually we recommend that in future that... Res sorry, do you want me to stop at that point? Before we go on to the next yeah, two, yeah, we've got no. two that want to come in. So oh, sorry, Councillor yeah. Cook and Councillor Harper. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, obviously, I wish to agree with Councillor Cook, because um, it's usually in my benefit and the safety of my breathing uh, to do so. Um, I think as this process has transpired is, I think, I think first thing to say is council officers have followed procedure as they need to follow procedure, right? I don't think anybody stepped out of line as such. I think what we discovered is there might be some holes in the procedure that we might need looking at, but it's a complicated one. And as Councillor Cook has alluded to, what concerns me greatly is every two a few years we employ a company to do a stock condition survey of our council housing stock so garages houses flats that are council houses which obviously include the leaseholder properties as well that are former council houses that have gone under right to buy now as we've learned through this process is the way the stock condition survey is approached is they sample around 20 percent of similar properties and then do some sort of data analysis to say this amount of roofs will need doing at this date even if those roofs have never been looked at that concerns me massively that actually we've potentially sent letters to quite a number of tenants that are affected by this roofs issue sorry not tenants uh, leaseholders that are affected by this issue of roofs to say we might be asking you for nine thousand pound which is obviously with some of them been quite upsetting when actually these roofs potentially have never been looked at yeah. because because of the finances of the council we have to model that way because we couldn't send under stock condition survey somebody out to 4,000 plus properties mm -hmm. because it, the council just couldn't ever afford to do so and that is a complication but unfortunately through that process then what we do is then end up leaning on some people and I'm not looking to insult anybody <coughs> I congratulate anybody who's bought their council house right to buy you have the right to own your own property you have the right to have your house and leave it to your children absolutely support that process but you wouldn't live in a former council house if you had thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds lying around in the bank Sometimes it concerns me, certainly in the high-rise flats, that we approach people for money that haven't got this money in a very aggressive way because that's what our policy and the law says and the legal process pushes us to do. First and foremost, I'd like somebody to actually go and look at these roofs before we continue because at the minute we, we don't know if these roofs need doing or not. Under the process, we consult with the uh, leaseholders and after the consultation is complete, then somebody actually goes and assesses the roofs. That should be the other way around. And if that's a cost... Uh, prohibitive things is council it's something we need to analyze and it's a real concern of mine i think i've got that about right haven't i thank you mr chairman thank you potentially really stupid question because i don't know what types of properties they are are, are they houses or are they flats um, a mix so if you think some are semi-detached houses some are effectively um, a semi-detached house with a masonette next door and um, so they might have kind of two flats attached to it so, or it could be four flats depending. So, so it's a real mix of for those ones I, I, I get but the ones where it's just a semi-detached house why does the council care well, no not care but why, why is there any concern of the council's about their roof it's, it's not... so so technically when we sell properties off we usually keep the freehold ultimately. So at some point, okay. i.e. 99 years or 999 years, whatever they're sold off as, at that point they would revert back to the council ultimately. Okay. All right, so bring in Councillor Harper. Thank you, Chair. Um, most of the points have been eloquent, very eloquently put forward by uh, Councillor Cook and backed up by Councillor Cook. 
Um, it's pity perhaps we haven't got another councillor cook here who's put an awful lot of work into this project as well. Um, it's certainly not a case of too many cooks. But it's, uh, I think we've got a, we are learning some very valuable lessons from this whole exercise because um, the, um, the owners of these properties have been put under a lot of pressure and fear because of this. Not only fear that um, they're going to have to stump up a, a good load of cash to put these problems right, but the fact that they might be living in houses that are unsafe, which is probably not the case. So um, I think we need to improve, as Councillor Cook said, communications and engagement with, um, with residents in future, because um, I think the way this has actually panned out is uh, is quite wrong and um, it does nobody any credit um, but I'm sure that we will come to a, a good um, result and um, the only thing I would suggest is it needs to be done as quickly as possible to remove this uh, fear from the uh, from the householders thank you okay thank you very much councillor Goodall and then we'll come back Thank, thanks, Jay. Yeah, just wanted to agree with Danny's sort of summary. Really, um, <clears throat> I think I think the working group did probably agree that the process, as it is at the moment, has been followed. It's just got a number of holes in it, and I think um, I think probably some of these. These potential recommendations might might assist moving forward in uh, in filling those holes in and making it a little bit more comfortable for for residents. So that's all I want to say at the moment. Thank you, Councillor Danny Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was just in answer to your earlier question. Um, it comes from the um, the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act, which is known as a Long Term Quantifying Agreement. Uh, basically, that Act of Parliament basically means that even though under right to buy tenants have bought their own council house or council flat, this council still re retains the absolute responsibility ensuring the freehold and the roof and the walls and everything remain safe and enacting the works. Now, we, we can argue whether that's right or wrong as to we're blue in the face. That's an Act of Parliament. And as we always say, just like the man on the street, councils must follow the law of the land as well. So, as, as we're all saying, process hasn't technically been broken. What we spotted, as Councillor Goodall eloquently said, is some holes in the process that potentially we could improve. Well, we still have to, to a degree, work within the Act of Parliament. And it's striking a good balance of better communication and how we manage the process, I think, is where we're headed. If that helps, Mr Chairman. Yep, great, thank you. Back to you then, Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you, and thank you to members for those um, inputs as well. I think, in addition to the fact that kind of ultimately the way we've done things it's really really important to stress that none of the residents have said they're not prepared to pay for the works the value and the figures that are being banded around they have serious concerns about and i think again the working group were also slightly perplexed at some of the figures that were being quoted and that they've been um, kind of given especially when you look at some of the um the varying figures and the fact that quotes were not including things such as scaffolding. Well, I, I'm no roof expert, but I would assume that if we're going to be taking w works on a roof, there will be scaffolding requirements. So actually a requirement for um, costs to be set out absolutely clearly in the same way as if you or I were planning on having works done to our properties, we would be saying, give us a full and final quotes for doing what you're doing your experts give us that information so that's another recommendation that we've got that people deserve to know exactly what they've been asked to pay for after they've had an actual survey undertaken to say is the works required or not um, we're also suggesting that um, the council look at using where possible an independent assessor for works um, again is it robbing peter to potentially pay paul um, from somebody goes in and says i'm going to you need the work doing well if you're getting paid for doing that work potentially there is a I'm not saying that's the case but potentially 
And even if that's not possible as a general standard, with those residents who have been put through months of stress, and I think I don't think I'd be wrong in saying months of stress, um, actually giving someone actually some sort of independent, this is what's required, would be a way of rebuilding some of that trust because at the moment a lot of those residents do not have trust in the council um, and the process that we've gone through. We're also suggesting that no works are done to the current batch of leaseholders or other leaseholders works until that's happened or um, and there's been that independent inspection and revised letters sent out to people to actually understand exactly what is required and confirmation of work is needed or not on their properties. Um, we're also suggesting that, um, where is that in terms of communications, there's a couple of areas here. First one, we've seen evidence of where people have purchased properties, so either through right to buy or on the open market, where the, the documentation that effectively a solicitor asks the council to provide has not demonstrated that Section 20 works are required within the two-year period. So again, I know that would be a legal challenge ultimately that, that, partic that well, those particular cases would have to make directly via their solicitors, but making sure that when we provide information to residents who are looking at buying, or general residents that are looking at buying properties, that we're actually being really, really clear on what's actually required. And a recommendation ultimately that we produce something that Tamil Council slash its solicitors can provide to purchasers, solicitors, to say this is actually what it means to buy a former council property because actually it, it does go above and beyond what it would be on the open market because we have those extra standards that we have to have. Um, we also found, and I think this again was all members of the working group that kind of contributed to it, found that the communications that have been issued to residents and to leaseholders has not been fit for purpose. Again, not saying that people have been doing anything wrong in terms of their jobs, but actually the language and the tone is set at a level that the vast majority of people, it's, it's, not, it's not accessible and it's not transparent. Um, and myself and certainly Councillor Chris Cook, who's had an awful lot more to do with it than I have, have sat with people who genuinely didn't understand what was being asked for and some of the lang language is so complicated it was difficult for us as councillors and long-standing councillors to understand what some of them were being asked so actually some work to not only simplify letters but making sure that they are understandable to the audience that they are actually going out to and finally a, re a further recommendation that the contractor once kind of that process has started, actually hold at least two face-to-face -face consultation drop-ins or something similar so that people can come in and actually talk <coughs> to the contractors to find out what does it mean, what's going to happen. This is exactly what, when I was portfolio holder organised with the sprinkler system, it was a flat that was done so people would go in and actually understand and it was something really, really simple as, actually, this is where the sprinkler is, and this is how we do it, and this is what we do, rather than people thinking they're going to have all of their <coughs> stuff taken off um, the walls. So actually making sure what the expenses are, what they're going to have to pay, and actually giving people that understanding. And I suppose the, the final thing I will say is, whilst at the moment it's only 44 leaseholders, the 72 properties that are at part of this process and this particular batch of Tamil Borough Council stock, we've replaced those reeves on an ongoing basis because the stock condition survey or the 20% assessed have said that they need to be done, but actually there is a really big risk that not all of them needed full reef replacements and when we're looking at the HRA difficulties longer term, actually for me especially, 
that's got some major concerns that we're potentially spending taxpayers' cash and our own resources on things that do not need to be done at this particular point in time. And I think from that point alone, from the long-term financial viability of this council's housing stock, we need to look at refreshing our policies. And that, Mr Chairman, is where the working group has got to. And we're happy to take any questions or if anyone else wants to check in or any other members, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Straight up to you then. Come on in. Yeah, sorry if this is obvious. Um, <clears throat> so further to what Councillor Danny uh, Cook was saying about the payment on the property. So the properties that have decided that they need works, the leaseholder, um, this payment, they're not expected to pay that up front, are they? That is that part of a payment plan? So again, the councillor cook might have a bit more understanding on that but from a from my understanding is that we have if once we've decided that works are required on a leaseholder's property they are given a bill with 28 days to pay and some of those costs are between 19 and 18 thousand pounds that we're asking them to pay yeah from personal experience owning an ex-local authority uh, flat in london they give you 28 days um they offer you some kind of function like a loan function of interest if you can if you want to do it but if not it's 28 days to pay up front one way or the other do you want to come in there yeah there, there is a little bit of history to this just to, for the committee to understand um obviously uh, when the current act of parliament came in i think it was around 2005 six um the council tried to enact a process certainly with the high-rise flats where we, we tried to create almost a pay-as-you-go system. I can't remember the exact figures, so I'm spitballing a little bit, if everybody will bear with me. So for the sake of argument, if you'd bought your own flat in the high rise, we would charge you £5 a week. That would go into a ring fence fund to build up over the years, so any works required, that fund would pay them. And the council would top up, or if the fund got to such a massive amount, it would remain ring fence to continue to do work for leaseholders. Uh, a section of the leaseholders in the high-rise flats took the council to court saying actually we us taking money from them for works that weren't needed yet was illegal. Uh, the court fundamentally agreed with the leaseholders and said the council couldn't build a fund that way but then uh, ruled, uh, the judge ruled in judgment that actually what we should be doing is doing the works they needed doing and giving the, uh, the leaseholders 28 days to pay. So that is actually a judgment of a court, not a judgment on this council. Yeah. So it, it was unfortunate this council didn't break the law as such, but we were working a little bit outside of the law, trying to do what we thought was the right thing, proved we shouldn't have been doing that, but what we ended up with was a court judgment that said 28 days to pay. Now this council has proved very good at working with leaseholders wherever possible, where that just doesn't quite work of perhaps looking at a longer term payment option or even on some occasions put it against the value of the property that should that tenant eventually sorry the leaseholder eventually sell the property or unfortunately um, pass on the council then can recover that money later i actually suspect some of the high-rise flats this council might already own some of them back it's happened that often so we do try as a council to behave with some decency but yeah technically under the law as council Gutter says you have 28 days to pay once the works have been done which is going back to it a lot of these leaseholders don't have you know nine ten twenty thirty thousand pound lying around and sometimes it is a tragedy of this process that we're going to some people that haven't got those funds available and putting them through this stress so i just think if we're going to do that let's just make sure that actually the works were needed 100 percent in the first place I think is where we're trying to get to as a working group, isn't it? I hope that helps, Sam. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and, and I know from that personal example I gave that the packs that come out, they're so big that I just looked at it for it's just junk. I didn't even look until I got the bill. And then I realised I hadn't been to two consultations because the pack was so big. I didn't even want to read it anyway. That's a cook. Thanks. And I, I think just to kind of follow on from that, that point, some of the figures, if, if, if it's something that's absolutely essential people don't mind paying those sort of figures i think the, the question of when people are not getting clear bills and it's an estimate of what's required it scares the life out of people and that kind of general principle of going we are telling our, our town's residents ultimately our leaseholders that they've got to pay colossal amounts of money when there's actually no guarantee that they need it and when they do need it 
we're not in a position to actually say, here is an itemised bill, because, oh, we might find asbestos. Well, you might find asbestos, but then if you do, then this is the extra little bit, what it needs to be. And I think it's just actually saying, let's be really clear and concise with people on what is required and not spending cash for the sake of spending cash because 20% of properties may need work doing to them. Because you would not operate like that if you ran a, a business or your own personal finances, so why should we expect others to do the same? Yeah, thank you. So it sounds like you know the, the process has been followed, the law has been followed, as we said. Some residents may end up having to pay it, some may not. Uh, but in general, it sounds like we're going to have a, some positive recommendations for for these for these residents, and then potentially wider residents if it then touches on that wider council funds. That that last point, so sounds good to me. Um, so what's the timeline then for preparing something that we can then review here and then uh, recommend on? I'll get my question answers first, and I'll continue. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm. I'm ultimately. I'm more than happy to move those recommendations um, and circulate them around kind of the wide group and take them to cabinet absolutely fine. Um, I subject to the rest of the working group being happy with kind of where we've got to. I don't think there's anything, should we say, more that we're waiting for um, on that. But ultimately, it's, it, it's that point now ultimately that says we either go down a route of doing that or the council continues in the way that we, as a working group, didn't think that was, even though the, 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 legally it was perfectly fine, it's not open and transparent enough to actually, for due process, so I think actually it's scrutiny to say we can do better and we should do better. So the only thing I'd personally say to that is that we've, so we've heard the recommendations which I thought were the sort of draft We've not seen it with the background to then be able to say if we agree. It's all, a, it's all I'm thinking. Did you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, I've been fortunate to see these recommendations in text as, as Michelle kindly distributed them around the working group. Um, and they, they are very much draft, I think. I think Michelle would agree. I've just very, very quickly just written some written them written them out again but simplified them really because I, I think sometimes recommendations to cabinet can be a little bit woolly sometimes I guess um, so I've, I've very quickly just bullet pointed them <coughs> because I, I, I don't see any reason why we can't move forward tonight with with with, with some of these rather than <coughs> yeah so uh, one, I've got recommend that TBC look at using an independent assessor for works to confirm costs are correct as a number one. Two, recommend that the assessment is done for all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute to repairs. Three, recommend to reinforce TBC communications when residents buy a council house, including what responsibilities and obligations are on the owner occupier. Uh, four, recommend that the communications relating to leaseholder works are reviewed and simplified. Five, recommend that our contract hold at least two face-to-face -face consultation drop-ins to enable residents to understand the process. I think that captures probably the what what, what the working group wanted and, and makes it a, perhaps a little bit briefer, but that's up to the committee. Okay, Councillor Court, you want to come in? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to second those simplified recommendations. I think actually that's really, really absolutely spot on, Simon. Really can support that. I'd just like to add one on to the end. Obviously, this issue sparked up because obviously um, got a lady in the audience of a current issue, which is the roofs. I'd like to start the next one. We actually get those roofs assessed before we continue any process on the thing that's actually started this in the first place, because I think that's what's kicked this off. And we've put some, you know, for a couple of years, some leaseholders through some pain through COVID as things got delayed, and they've lived with this for two years, the fear of these costs. Let's actually go get to the bottom of, do they need to pay for these roofs or not? So I'd like to have that as an extra one at the end. Let's get these ones that actually started this process assessed straight away. And then if that can be added, Simon, I'll happily second. To be clear, that's the, is it 44? Is it that? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah. Can I potentially ask one other thing? And this is something that we I have we haven't discussed with the working group. It's just something that kind of on conversations earlier that I kind of thought about. There's been quite a significant time delay over the last few months while we've been looking at this. And during that time, we all know that costs have gone up, which they have, increases, etc. cetera. Um, building costs and materials have gone up. I think it's just really important to say, because we've effectively looked at this as a delay, there is a potential that the contractor comes back and says things are more expensive than they were when we started looking at this. Is there any way at all of saying that if that is the case, that costs that have already been advised are not increased because of the fact we've had to look at this as a... And I don't know how we look at that, but I'm just thinking it's something that... Is that something that we think... Because potentially, <coughs> that is, that's a risk, potentially. I suppose yeah. that was adequate to that. Well, I agree, like, the sentiment, but is, is that not the case of anything? So if, it's, if it started and then it took nine months to deliver, it would be more expensive anyway. By the time we got to the end, the, I don't think any builder has ever hit the, the quote they've given you, have they? It always goes up, but... Will that not happen anyway, naturally? don't know. Just say, it, was just, it was something I was thinking about on the way driving here tonight, and I was thinking, actually, I don't want it to be a case that those individuals that have sat and waited for us to have our meetings and to do things potentially get penalised by coming through this process. I don't know. Might not. They might not. But is it something that's potentially there? I don't know. Well, let's hear from Simon then. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, agree with the sentiment... I'm, I'm not sure whether we can sort of capture it because we're trying to improve the process moving forward rather than a process that's perhaps in existence. So, and just on another another point, Dan, Danny's other recommendation, I wonder, I wonder whether that is captured within recommend that the assessment is done for all repairs in advance of leaseholders being asked to contribute to repairs. I'm just wondering whether that's... I think it's more specific and it's specific to this group, whereas that's more widely for future. Yeah, okay. I just want to be very clear. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what are you saying about this, this, last, this last one? I mean, it, it, it could be put in in a way that's not... not I know we, we can't bind anyone anyway, but in a way it doesn't really commit. It gives them an opportunity to you know, use discretion and goodwill if they so desire. I don't know, some way of wording it. Oh, we're sending it to Cabinet, Mr Chairman. That okay. We you guys are the working group. What do you think? I think that is spot on there. It's their recommendations to, to Cabinet. Cabinet can, can pick and choose, decide to take all of them, decide to take none of them modify them so it, it's it's uh, it, it, it's for them ultimately to make make that decision I think it's I think it's a reasonable thing to to recommend last one yeah adding in okay as a harper did you have a view on that yeah just to concur with what's been said um, I think it's a really good set of recommendations I think they're well thought out I think they're very sensible and um, will will serve the present situation and future uh, situations uh, um, well, but I would just say that we need to get this moving quickly. And obviously, you're right; costs will go up. Um, this needs to be put to bed, and um, I would suggest we do it as quickly as we can. Okay. Well, unless anyone's got something, I'll come to you in a second. Unless anyone's got anyone any reason not to do it tonight, then I'll, I'm. Happy from what I've heard, Councillor Cook. Uh, yeah, just if it helps you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, obviously taking on board that well, Councillor Cooper and Councillor Cook work in rail infrastructure, and they see costs go up every second minute, so they understand that process. Uh, I just wonder if it would help you, Mr. Chairman, if uh, we also agree as a committee that Councillor Michelle Cook and Councillor Chris Cook from the Cross Party Working Group go and give the recommendations to Cabinet because they've got the background, rather than yourself who hasn't sat in the working group who hasn't got all that would it be worth sending them to make the recommendation not to undercut you mr chairman but obviously they've done the work and you know the rest of us on the working group i think would agree that you know michelle and chris have done the real work and they understand the background would it be worth sending them to make the recommendations in case cabinet have got questions you know it is cross-party so 
I just wondered if that was worth it for you, Mr. Chairman. I'm totally on board with that, as long as that's allowed. I think so. Yeah. If Joe said, yeah, if you're saying I, so. It's the recommendations. You're the boss. You're the boss here. <laughs> I think it's the recommendations of the committee um, that have been brought forward, and it might help. I don't know if, as vice chair, Danny, you would you'd go or, or chair. Does, and does go it together. matter if? Does, is it, does it, is there anywhere in any of our rules in the rep terms of reference that it must be the chair or vice chair that submits recommendations? I don't take my wife out very often, so I'm happy to go with her. <laughs> I don't think so, but if you want me to check, I'll just have a quick check now. I, I would say, and... yeah, I'd say if it's not, and it can be any member of the committee, then I absolutely support that because, yeah. you know, they're the ones that get, get it all. That's a good up. I would suggest having an expert witness with you would be, a, with a, would be the right thing to do. Um, and when is the next? So I need to look at that. The 23rd of February is a cabinet meeting. Well, I'm, I'm on holiday anyway, so um, and then after definitely going to be me. Well, I'll make myself available, but if the two that have done the work can. If they can, then yeah, I'm happy well, with that. After that's the 16th of March. Yeah, and like we talked about a minute ago, in the interest of it being as soon as possible, we should go for the 23rd. Yeah. And if the rules allow it, then I, I'd go with that. That's a good one. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, bearing that in mind, um, I'm quite happy if these recommendations are moved by by Michelle if she's done perhaps the majority of the work on this. Um, if if I, or I don't mind seconding, but I think it might be a the right thing. Okay, so moved by Councillor Michelle Cook. Absolutely, thank you. And I was just going to say thank you for making them more succinct than my kind of like typing notes. So yeah, no, I'm more than happy to move those formally. And um, I just want to say, especially I know Chris isn't, hasn't made it, I know he was hoping to, but again, thank you so much to the whole working group for the input and the time and meeting on a Sunday evening to um, go through it. It really just shows when you do get together and work, it shows what you can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And second by Councillor Goodall. Yeah, happy with that. All those in favour? Great, thank you very much. Yeah, sounds like a really good piece of work. Thank you very much. Um, next one. Do you need? Do you need me to wait while you look at that? Because you're taking notes, or you? No, no I was. I'm, I'll be fine with. The okay, good. Um, <laughs> That's why we record meetings, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, Nine forward plan this is to consider whether there are f any further items on the forward plan which this committee would like to consider. The new items, which may or may not be relevant, which have been added since the last meeting, are there are four um, comments, compliments, complaints, and managing unreasonable customer be behavior policies, which is due at cabinet on the 23rd of February. Is that something we want to consider? Probably not, would be my view, but no. Review of fees and charges 23-24 due at cabinet on 23rd of Feb. No. Recovery and reset programme exit strategy due at cabinet on 31st of March 2023. Uh, we tend to get reset and recovery as a, a key thing as quarterly performance reports, so I think as a committee we're already covered off on looking at reset and recovery. Yep, happy with that. Uh, and then last one, income management and recovery policy, council housing, due at cabinet on 27th of April. Is that something we'd look at? Process. No. Good. Um, next one, corporate scrutiny working plan. So at the November meeting, we um, discussed the social housing preparedness item. We agreed to keep in the work plan. I know we went recently informally to talk about that. Um, <coughs> Committee members emailed in January to request any further questions or comments on that. So I just want to reiterate that just check that email if you've got any comments or questions. Let's say when the time is running out, so let's say within the next week, get those comments or questions in. Yeah, because we need time to the, the team need time to answer them, prepare them for the meeting in March. It'd be unfair to then come in March and have a ream of questions that they've not had time to prepare for. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, and then we're going to consider that on the 9th, 9th of March. Does anyone have anything they want to raise on that now, tonight while we're here? No? Okay. 
the March meeting, we have an update on this short project, the regulation social housing item we just talked about. Um, proposing adding the Solway Trading Company update to that meeting because in the terms of reference of the committee we're supposed to have it. The likelihood is it's going to be a one-line update anyway, but just to tick that box, I think we should add it on. It's not going to add much time to the meeting. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. As a former director of Solway Trading, um, as a former leader of the council, it's a company we set up many, many years ago uh, to look to not so much circumnavigate the operations of local government, but look for opportunities that a company wholly hold by the council could perhaps chase where better services to the public are, greater savings to the taxpayer. However, the company has never, ever been used. It's sat there ever since, probably costing us £3,000 a year just to keep its accounts going. You're absolutely correct. It'll be a one-line update because the company has technically been used. Sorry, it's technically never really been used. However, it is another tool in the toolbox that sits there. So I suspect you will get a one-line update yeah. that it's still sat there to a degree, for want of a better term, dormant. Yeah. Okay, so is everyone happy about adding that to the agenda? It's not going to... Because normally we wouldn't have that many items, but as it's going to be two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we then penciled in to bring back the feedback on the QPR working group. But as we touched on earlier, we're going to push that to the start of the municipal year, right? So it gives time for everyone to... Yeah. So everyone's been busy with the other more important, more pressing uh, item. Okay. Anyone got anything to add to that? Are you happy with that agenda? Uh, action log, as we talked about earlier, we've added the asset management strategy recommendations to that, so we keep an eye on those for later, make sure that actually we actually get an answer back. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone in the working group again. And uh, that will close the meeting at 7.12. Thank you very much. Yeah.